Good afternoon. I am Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. Residents of West Kingston protested this morning, claiming they are being abused by members of the Jamaica Defense Force JDF. The mother of a 17-year-old boy alleges that her son was taken from his home and beaten by the soldiers. That led to a protest and roadblock along a section of Spanish Town Road. Senior Superintendent of Police Steve McGregor, who was once in charge of the Kingston Western Police Division, sought to reassure residents. Mix with young warfare and violence. So you know like how me used to do it? Anywhere shot a fire, nothing can go on. I want to know it go. I may always tell you. If shot now fire, we will make it go on. Hold on. Hold on. I have impressed upon Mr. Gray. So he can do some things what me used to do. So if you not be able to self, I want to invite Mr. Gray. He will come. And just like when we used to tell him, if me come, it go until me left. Yes. So it means uh, if you not do the thing proper, yes. I want to enjoy without violence or anything like that. West will run like a West run. You understand what I'm saying? Member of Parliament for Western Kingston, Desmond McKenzie, also spoke with the residents. And since Monday night, I've been in touch with the police high command on the matter about the, the concerns of the residents. I want to make the point that despite whatever negative people might have about West Kingston and especially the people in Tiberia, majority of the people here are law-abiding, decent, honest people. I would not deny that there are some amongst the community who would do anything against the law and has been doing that. They have no support and protection from the community, but also the rights of those residents in the community need to be respected. Some of what has been said and what I've heard on video being said to the residents by members of the security forces is very distressing. I have given the assurance to the community that I will ensure that whatever is done in terms of policing is done within the ambit of the law. Some schools will have to remain on the shift system come September as major cuts to the Education Ministry's budget has delayed plans for their removal. The update was given at Tuesday's sitting of Parliament's Public Administration and Appropriations Committee PAAC examining the first supplementary estimates. The Education Ministry initially got $1.48 billion to deal with capital expenditure for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. But due to the economic downturn resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, that allocation has been cut to $633 million. The end result? Some schools may have to remain on the shift system. Our policy was that we wanted to take all schools off the shift system. It's something we were working towards assiduously and we were sort of looking down the line to say when it was going to happen. I suspect that what you're telling us, that that is in deep jeopardy right now. There is definitely going to be a delay in terms of us being able to remove the schools off shift. Uh, we, are, we have not taken a decision as yet as it relates to shift because our schools understand the challenges that they have been through, especially those that have just come off shift. And so we are still in discussion as it relates to the approach that we will be using. And as I have said, this has to be specific to each school. It's 36 schools are on the shift system. Now with the capital budget being cut, nine projects will be affected. The, the schools are uh, Albert Town High School, Exchange, uh, Orange and Juna High School, Homo Technical Bridge Port High School, Cedric Titus, Westwood, Phase 2, Black River, Phase 2, Edwin Allen High School, 
and Dias Infant School, which is really a new infant school that we had on our plans to build and we are going through the process of completing the procurement activities. Those procurement activities will however be completed this year. Construction is expected to begin in May 2021 if money becomes available. In the meantime, the ministry is still working out details to ensure adequate physical distancing in classrooms come September. What we have also um, done using GIS mapping is to identify all the churches and other facilities that are located in and around our schools that could possibly be utilized for classroom spaces. So we now have that data available. In the meantime, by the end of this week, education officers will be working with schools to develop individual plans for them to operate during the COVID-19 period. Cabinet is expected to sign off on the policy in July. As part of the plan, technology will be utilized. Computers will be purchased for students on PATH. And we had our bring your own device policy, which we call our BOID policy approved at our last senior policy meeting which will allow for our our schools to have this on their book list where parents can purchase a tablet the ministry will upload all the content for the curriculum onto the tablets so that even if you do not have internet access you have on your tablets or your computers that can be utilized in the meantime the ministry has formally begun the process of having a partnership with private schools where we will be placing some of our students from PEP who are the ones who are on pathway 2 and 3, the lower performing students, really in some of our private schools once they agree. And we have many. We have over, when we had our meeting last week, we had over 250 representatives and they are now submitting their expression of interest so that placement will be done. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News, but stay with us. We have much more stories when we return. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. Members of the St. Anne Municipal Corporation are still concerned over the installation and subsequent removal of a hybrid charging port for a Porsche motor vehicle belonging to the mayor. It cost $80,000. As we hear in this report, the issue was again raised on Power 106 FM's Morning Agenda program. Despite the announcement by May of the St. Anne's Municipal Corporation that the $80,000 controversial hybrid charging port has been returned and money recouped, the issue is still causing concerns for the minority group in the council, the PNP. Speaking at a special press briefing yesterday, Mayor Michael Belnavis noted that since he's taken office, he has been using his personal vehicle to carry out the corporation's work. No vehicle was provided to me, which is not the norm for mayors. From the municipality saving taxpayers millions and millions of dollars is what has really been the situation. I have not applied for traveling for the past three years. As a matter of fact, that is, this has only happened once, which I have um, entitled, which I've been really been entitled to, saving the taxpayers quite some money. My venture into politics has never been anything except to serve the public, something many of my detractors could never say with a straight face. But the minority leader in the corporation, Winston Brown, is livid. As he says, a number of provisions are there which the mayor can't benefit from, such as traveling. As to the charging port, he says no discussion was held at the municipal corporation when the port was being procured and installed. He says everything was done on the order of the mayor. Mr. Brown says he was made aware of the charging facility by utterances from another councillor. When I was at the council, I heard a councillor on his side was talking about it. So he after being buying gas, how comes the mayor? Charging his vehicle for him. So wait, what is that? And you're charging his vehicle. Wait, that's a weird vehicle charging. He said, downstairs. And I went downstairs and I searched. He said, no, but this can't be right. Mm -hmm. Because I know this should come to the finance committee seeking approval. He says, up to this day, the spend on the charging port was not ratified by the finance committee of the corporation. 
Mr. Brown says a number of efforts were made to get answers regarding the charging port. I raised I asked the question how it was approved and how it was installed. And the mayor, the mayor said to me, he, what I'm talking about, he don't, he don't know what I'm talking about. You mean he don't know what you're talking about? I, I, that's, what, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. It's, as the people was on charge at the stage, they what he said, he just don't know what I'm talking about. Like he, he didn't know about the installation of it. But what makes matters worse? What makes matters worse now? At the PAC, the TOO could say when it came to light, they remove it and they are going to recover the charge. Mm -hmm. So who are they going to who who are they going to recover it from? As to the disclosure yesterday that the port has been removed and costs recouped, questions are again being raised as he says no discussion was taken by the council to have a charging port removed. Who took that decision to remove it and recover the cost? I certainly know it's like the council. Mr. Brown says other questions are still left to be answered, such as who or which company did the council recoup the cost from for the charging port? O'Shane Masters. TVJ News. Employers are being warned that a serious breach is committed if labor officers are denied access to business establishments. The warning has come from the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. Permanent Secretary Colette Roberts Risden says employers who engage in such practices are breaching the Labor Officers Powers Act. This follows complaints that labor officers have been facing difficulties to carry out inspections in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. There are penalties in the legislation where someone who impedes a labor officer can be found guilty in a resident magistrate court and they can be fined. No, I don't recall the fine offhand, but they can be fined on conviction. But you know, it's not about the fine and about the penalty or the sanctions. It is about ensuring that we fulfill our duty as officers who have a mandate to ensure whether it be the safety of workers or to ensure that workers are being properly compensated and so forth. Now to a familiar problem, this time in St. Thomas. Residents are restless, demanding water. More in this report. A protest on Monday in Dalva Square, St. Thomas. No water. A plea heard too many times. Residents say they have been lacking the commodity for months and the springs have dried up, forcing them to resort to other methods to cleanse themselves. We have got a spring. Oh, look, water. I would tired no for your walk. Far, far, far is for your walk. We need some water now. Oh, come on, say, I leave. Maybe I take a weapon off my hand. We get, we try to get a manga from my hand. I have no water. And we go call help with water. Some water around. Help me. Me can't be a good. We need half pint of water. Me can't get, get for wash my body part. Good, half fresh. Make it fresh. I smell good. Because I need no water. Me need water to wash all part of me. Come here, we need water. We now get no water. Sometimes we pass it for them, they arm run and frown because water shortage. No water for them be it properly. But for some, finding water is a difficult task, and water trucks are infrequent. Long time, me no bed no shower. And if I go to my bathroom, you know it stink because me no have no water for flush it. And sometimes the truck come, we full last and come and they give me 150 gallon drum. Me black tank in my house. Empty, empty, no water in the warm yard. And me a whole man, 80, 82 years of age, the wife of 79. And we can't walk one off, go look water. And the water bills have not stopped. But their ordeal is inexplicable, as one resident pointed out that they have water systems that could supply the community. A two water systems is there. One has medicine wall and one has Spanish wall. Spanish world cannot dry, right? We only go on and clean it up, clean up the area and develop the area, set it up where we can get a good water pump, it can dry, right? So it's not a matter of say we short of water, right? It's only because we don't have the right management and we need a proper management. Our news team contacted corporate public relations manager at the NWC, Andrew Cannon, 
who says more research on the issue will need to be conducted before he could provide a response. Kalisha Williams, TVJ News. The St. Catherine Infirmary received a thorough sanitization yesterday. Mayor of Spanish Town, Norman Scott, says the exercise is part of protecting vulnerable groups from COVID-19. 124 persons reside at the facility. He adds that the move is also part of preparations for the full reopening of the economy on June 15. With the fully reopening on the 15th, it is going to mean that all of these areas are going to be back to capacity activity. And as a result of that, we have to try and see how much we can minimize um, the, the exposure of this virus. The sanitization exercise was a gift to the infirmary from rent -a kill Initial Jamaica Limited. We really appreciate this gift. And uh, as a municipal corporation, you know, um, it has saved us some, some funds because uh, to sanitize this entire um, compound cost a pretty amount of money. In the meantime, other areas will also be sanitized. We, as it relates to sanitization, um, there are some areas that are on our list. Um, places like uh, Friend Street, Cumberland Road, um, parts of Burke Road, uh, the, the parts of King Street, of course, the car park. All of these areas, Linstead, Old Arbor, we are in the process of doing sanitization work in these areas also. And time now for a preview of what's coming up in this evening's health report. In the next edition of the health report, we'll look at managing HIV amid the coronavirus pandemic. Just take care of yourself because if to say then, all right, then you can get the chance to go and get your meds, go and get it. Do not wait until it's totally finished for you to go and get it. If you uh, visit the clinic regular and you have the number where you can call and let them know that prior to so and so, you are unable to come. But you know, but push out effort for know that well things are put in place for you that you can uh, and do the necessary thing, wear your mask, protect yourself. That's the health report this evening in primetime news. And now for today's healthy living tip. There are few ways that you can avoid giving HIV to other people. Start treatment for HIV as soon as possible and keep taking your medication. Don't share needles for shooting drugs, piercing, or tattoos. And get tested and treated for other STDs beside HIV regularly. And in sports, the U.S. women's national team has called on the United States Soccer Federation, UWSF, to repeal a policy forbidding players from kneeling during the national anthem and issue an apology to black players and fans. The UWSF held a special meeting today to consider scrapping the rule, which requires players to stand respectfully during the playing of national anthems at any event in which the federation is representing. Represented, kneeling has become a symbol of the fight against police brutality used by protesters who have flooded the streets of the United States following the death of George Floyd, a black man who died in police custody in Minneapolis last month. The UWSF told Reuters in an email earlier on Monday that a vote could come following Tuesday's conference call or on Friday at the quarterly executive board meeting. The policy was put in place in 2017 after a player took a knee during the playing of the national anthem prior to a match against Thailand the previous year. The move by the UWSF to reconsider its position comes after NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell said last week the league had made a mistake by not listening to players and encouraged them to speak out and protest peacefully. And that's it for the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.